Okay, so today we're joined by Avril, um, who is a parent of one of our uh, younger service users, Cormac. And my name is Leanne, and I am with the Children and Young Persons team with the NCBI. So Avril, thank you very much for joining us um, this morning. Um, can you maybe start off um, by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and growing up? Um, I am 35. I have the one little boy. Um, I have congenital cataracts and glaucoma. I have no sight at all. Um, I have one artificial eye because that eye was causing a lot of pain, so we got it removed. Mm -hmm. um, I use a guide dog for mobility. So kind of focusing in maybe on um, parenting as, as a person um, who has a vision impairment or is, is blind, um, I think that, that that'd be a lot of value in, in that kind of um, knowledge and information that you might have um, as a parent to Cormac. Um, did, you, did you always want to have children yourself when you were younger? Uh, yes, yes, I did, yeah. Okay. Um, was there ever a time where you thought that that might not be possible for you or did you ever feel there might be barriers to that? Uh, yeah, it was always something I wondered about. Um, my mum is visually impaired, so I guess I knew that someone mm. with a visual impairment could parent, but because mm -hmm. I had no sight, um, I did wonder how would I manage and um, mm -hmm. would it be something that, that I would, would be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think then I had all the same kind of worries that every every uh, pregnant person has but mm -hmm. um yeah I suppose I did have that addition that additional worry about uh, around some of the practicalities how would I actually manage them and mm -hmm. um, I suppose being a youth worker I had had mm -hmm. children in my world for a long time and I'd had the responsibility for caring for them which gave me a lot of confidence and a lot of sense of, yes, I can do this. I, I could be a parent because I, I have safely and mm -hmm. successfully helped and minded these children, which mm -hmm. I suppose did stand to me in, term, in terms of when mm -hmm. we decided to be parents, that that, that mm -hmm. was a bank of experience mm -hmm. and knowledge that I had built up. And then after university, life changed quite a bit and um, down the line Cormac came along. And how was your, I suppose, how was your, say, experience of, of pregnancy? How, how was that for you? Um, well, we'd already had a, a tough road to pregnancy because we okay. had to do um, fertility treatment, which mm. in and of itself is a, a journey, um, mm. whether you're sighted or not. It's a mm -hmm. emotional and financial and uh, physical. And uh, so it was. It was a long road. Um, my husband and I got married in 2011 and we didn't have Cormac till 2017. So it was a long road to parenthood. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, maybe because we'd had to, to follow that path, we were very ready to be yeah. parents when he eventually arrived. Okay, okay. And, and those appointments, um, I imagine they're daunting for, for an, anyone really. Um, and your appointments say... Um, for for when for during your, your pregnancy um how how did you say find the birth itself um how were you kind of guided through that um were you prepared for it um I will say we have a very good local maternity hospital and um when I was in the hospital they were very good some of the outpatient appointments um maybe were more difficult um very busy environments um mm -hmm. maybe some of the staff didn't have an awareness around disability there were a few occasions where there were comments about the fact that they'd never had a blind mother and okay when you're pregnant that can make you feel very vulnerable because you're mm -hmm. thinking well these are the experts and and they sound a bit unsure and then they had there had been they had offered to do the antenatal classes one to one to make mm -hmm. them more accessible rather than being part of a large group where maybe there would be a lot of use of visual tools like overheads and notes and stuff. But then mm -hmm. that never actually happened. And by the time mm -hmm. I got admitted, we still hadn't done any antenatal classes, which uh, that piece was kind of stressing me and worrying me. But then okay. um, I will say while I was in the hospital, so 
um, I had had gestational diabetes okay. and I found, I found the diabetic team really brilliant. They were, they were very good. They, they were very, um, they spoke directly to me. They weren't talking like to my husband about me. They were, they were much, mm-hmm. you know, because I had to check my sugars seven times a day and do insulin mm-hmm. it was a whole learning process. Um, yeah. We visitors in the background. <laughs> my guide dog is also here, but she's quiet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Cormac was diagnosed with um what's called IUGR so he wasn't growing um okay. so at um 36 weeks I was admitted to the hospital and they made the decision to do a cesarean section um mm-hmm. because they felt he would he needed to come out and he would do better out and mm-hmm. um, at that point I found them brilliant they allowed so I was in the hospital for probably two weeks where they were monitoring and they were um, waiting to get me to a little bit over 37 weeks to make it a bit safer to deliver him. And my guide dog was allowed to come stay every day so that I could, so I could walk around the hospital and stay moving to, to, to help with that part of it. Um, She went home at nighttime with my husband, but, Mm -hmm. but they were, they were brilliant. They, they gave me a room to myself, which had a, an accessible bathroom, that piece of it, they were absolutely I will say they were brilliant. Um, and then when he was delivered by section, um, there was no there was no complications that they um, he didn't need the special care unit. They did, thought he would, but he didn't. Um, mm-hmm. So he was able to be with me straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to breast, breastfeed him from from the very start. Um, so they they thought that he might need the special care unit and say before before he came along did they um bring you to to um to show you the special care unit to 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 have a feel of what that would be like uh you know because there was a lot of um infection control around there so they had walked me to the door to let me know where it would be and the room that I was in was going to be directly across from it so that it would make make it easier if he did have to be in special care for me only to have to walk straight across the corridor to to get to him mm-hmm. um, what other what other supports did you have say in the early stages I will say that um the first year was tough really tough um enjoyable and fun and loving but difficult um he fed every two hours, which meant mm. we got no sleep, really. <laughs> mm. um, he was never great for sleeping, which um, is something I've read is quite common with visually impaired children. I, I'm not a great sleeper myself, so mm. I wasn't too surprised by that element. Mm-hmm. Um, he was the only tiny baby I ever met that could stay awake for 12 hours straight. I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> um, but he didn't cry a lot. He, he was always a pretty happy baby, just not very much of a sleepy baby. Um, mm. But that first year, we spent a lot of time in Crumlin. We went to a lot of appointments. Some okay. weeks we went on Monday and then again on Friday. Some weeks we went on Monday and had to go back on Thursday and have surgery and stay mm. over and come back, come home on Friday. Mm. Um, he ended up having, I, I don't even remember, maybe eight, ten surgeries. A lot. Uh, it was a huge... Um, and how do you feel in, I suppose, because that can be daunting I, for, for any parent. Um, how were you feeling, say, about those surgeries and coming up to those surgeries? Did you feel prepared? Were you were you ready for them? Did you feel it might be something that he might have to have? So before he was ever born, we knew, like even before we, we, we got pregnant, we knew that there was a 50-50 chance that he would have the same eye condition that I have. My husband is sighted and doesn't have eye problems, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, congenital cataracts and glaucoma are are mm. inherited mm-hmm. um so we were aware of that being a possibility yes of course we hoped that we'd be the lucky side of that 50 50 toss but mm-hmm. unfortunately we weren't mm. um but I think it was different because I knew that was a possibility like I had already organized for the pediatrician to test his eyes in the maternity hospital before we left because a uh, vision test is not standard in newborns 
in the way all babies are now tested for their for their hearing at birth, mm-hmm. but, but no, their vision is not tested. But I I knew that with cataracts, we needed to move fast. So I had already organized for the pediatrician to come up and test him before we left. Um, mm-hmm. Cataracts in a baby are unusual and rare. So the pediatrician wasn't very sure, but mm-hmm. I knew by his reaction that he suspected they were there. Mm-hmm. And um, a, a close family relative had come in to see us. And I knew by her reaction that she was sure they were there. Um, mm-hmm. So mm. we had an appointment with the ophthalmologist before Comet was three weeks old. Um, so he was tiny and I was still recovering from a C-section. Mm. We had to travel quite a distance to uh, to go to the appointment. Mm-hmm. So it was a very early morning trying to, it was probably the first big outing we had with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wasn't at all surprised when, when the ophthalmologist okay. said, yeah, we're moving to surgery and we're, mm-hmm. I suppose, even though in an intellectual way, I knew we were going to be doing surgery very quickly. Uh, he was seven and eight weeks, one week after the other when they removed the cataracts. That's really tiny. That's um, mm-hmm. probably, I had confidence in the ophthalmologist and his skills. It was, it was the going under anesthetic piece that really, that frightened me and that stressed me. Um, mm-hmm. Leaving him in theatre. I'd never left him until I left him in theatre that day. And that was tough. Um, okay. Trusting him to essentially strangers and mm. hoping that he wouldn't have any bad reaction to anaesthetic. Uh, mm. That was that was a tough piece. Being being in, in the hospital, you're in an environment that's not your own. You're, mm-hmm. um, and then I suppose... We, I knew the cataract surgery was going to have to be done and we were expecting that. We were hoping afterwards that maybe the glaucoma wouldn't need surgery so soon. Mm-hmm. And certainly didn't expect it to need so much surgery. Um, that was tough because you would go to clinic and you were trying to get a tiny, tiny baby to cooperate with having their eyes tested, which is not something tiny babies want to cooperate mm-hmm. with. Um, mm-hmm they tend to have to sedate your baby to actually check their pressure, um, which means a full day visit. It means fasting them, which which is difficult. Like practically when you're breastfeeding and you're trying to fast your, your baby and you're holding them to comfort them, but then you, they can smell your milk. It's like mm. putting a dinner in front of someone and saying, no, you can't eat that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. you know, so that distressed him at times and you could have long, long waits while you're waiting and mm-hmm. you, know, you could be waiting for hours and, He's mm-hmm. getting upset and he just wants his milk and he's too little. He has no understanding of why he can't he can't mm-hmm. have his milk and you can't explain mm-hmm. it to him. Um, and what kind of um what kind of supports did did you link in with and did he link in with um after the surgeries? Um were there supports uh, kind of locally around you after that? We linked in with the likes of public health nurse. Um yeah, so our public health nurse would have would have popped in a few times. We do have, I don't know if every county has this, but in our county we have a physical and sensory disability nurse. Okay. Um, so she would have come to us when he was about five months old. She was very good. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose initially we spent so much time going up and down to the hospital that we didn't actually link in with mm-hmm. anybody else for a while because <laughs> literally getting through the week and mm-hmm. getting up and down to Crumlin was about as, as much as we managed. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And the later, types of, say, supports that you might link in with now, um, what, what would you what would you find is, has been helpful or even activities um, that you've had him involved in? Um, we, so he was seen by the local dietitian at about, for a few months from kind of six to 12 months. Because he was very slow to want to take to um, to solids, um, a lot of that we suspect now was to do with going through so much surgery at you know maybe only two or three weeks apart. I think he was in a lot of discomfort and he just didn't have that interest. He he just he wasn't mm-hmm. comfortable enough to want to explore and to feed. Um, 
We also saw a physio for a few sessions. Um, that was really helpful, actually, to to help him start moving. So he, he sat up independently at an age that you would expect, but there was no sign of movement. There was no crawling or, or that kind of input for mm-hmm. for a while. So the the few sessions we did with the local physio in the in the primary care team was very good. Um, that just helped him to start exploring a bit and I, mm-hmm. she she was very good she was very good to show me with my hands how to turn him how to position him mm-hmm. to try and encourage him to move a bit more so she was kind of tactilely um introduce some ways for you to to maybe do yeah what she was doing she, at home she was really good she was really open to the idea that you know not just showing me visual not just saying oh this is how you do it and, and doing it visually you know she was very <laughs> open to actually mm-hmm all three of us being down on the floor and her positioning yeah. my hands on his body to show me how to move him and how to um, encourage that movement. And mm-hmm. um, then definitely the children and young people service we have found very helpful. Um, <coughs> actually, even probably more so since lockdown, since we've been doing the learning through play, um, we, we never actually managed to get to one of the real world learning through play sessions. But the virtual ones have been lovely in terms of mm-hmm. introducing Comer to the idea of what uh, school might be like because we're preparing for pre- preparing him for play school, but also having him know that there are other children who wear glasses, for example. Yeah. He, mm-hmm. he didn't. He hadn't really met other small children wearing glasses, and he was delighted mm-hmm. to that other children in his in his learning through play sessions were wearing glasses or mm-hmm. chatting to the other parents was has been lovely as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And would he have kind of that understanding maybe about his his own vision now? Um, would he uh, speak to him about his his sight? Yes. Yeah, so we do talk to him about it. I'm not sure because at two, their world is their only experience of the world. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure that he really comprehends that he sees the world differently than a, a fully mm-hmm. sighted person. Mm-hmm. I think maybe he thinks everybody sees like him. Um, mm-hmm. he, occasionally, we've had a few moments in the last few weeks where I think he might be starting to realise that there are times where other children see more things than he does. Okay. We were in the playground a few weeks ago after lockdown and he he seemed to realise that um, other children, he happened to be there with a younger relative and he mm-hmm. seemed to realise that even though that child was a year younger than him, he was actually moving more through the environment, okay. whereas he himself knew that he had to slow and mm. that he wasn't aware, he needed some help around not walking into the pathway of the zip wire or the swings. Mm-hmm. And he seemed to pick up on the fact that the younger child didn't need that level of assistance because um, mm. he came home and asked me a little bit about that. Um, I tend to answer if he asks me questions I tend to answer him as much as I think he will understand because mm-hmm. I think it's probably better for him to keep that conversation open and let him yeah. explore it as the opportunities come up as as he encounters those type of experiences but yeah have you ever um did you ever seek out other parents who were blind as well um no, I didn't, but I have to say as a as part of the learning through play sessions, that has actually mm-hmm. for me been a really useful part of it is is that because it, it can be difficult to find other um either other blind parents or to mm-hmm. find other sighted like parents who are sighted but have visually impaired children. It's a small community. Um mm-hmm. when you've got the double effect of a blind parent and a visually impaired child that's probably mm-hmm. even a smaller subset um mm-hmm. so yeah it's not um I suppose sometimes in the hospital you might chat to another parent in outpatient mm-hmm. um but you don't often that's often quite a very busy environment 
And just to say, um, for say listeners, that the, the learning through play is um, is a, a session that's held um, by the Children and Young Persons Service, um, and usually held at one of the bases. Um, but at the moment, it's been online, which um, has been useful for for yourself in that you've been able to log in, um, join other parents, and it's about a half an hour an hour um, session in that there is um, there's play activities with um, with with a kind of a learning outcome and Cormac's gotten to meet other um, children from from the session as well. Um, and and you've gotten to meet other parents as well, which yeah. has been useful um, and useful for 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 parent other parents logging in as well to get to ask questions and um, to maybe tap into the knowledge that you have as well. Um, have you have you made any kind of um, or felt that you had to make any um, adaptations at home with Cormac um, um, kind of getting that little bit bigger, a little bit more independent? Have you had to make any changes at all around your own environment? Um, well, inside the house, I would have always described our house as very uh, blind friendly um, <laughs> for my own mobility and safety. Mm. So in that sense, we we didn't have to do a lot extra. I would suspect maybe in a household where the only vision impaired person is the child, mm. maybe that would take more adaptation. For example, here, before Cormac was ever born, I always had furniture in straight lines. I always had it against the walls. I tended to have free open floor space. Mm -hmm. Don't have things like little lamps and little side tables and coffee tables. Mm -hmm. I don't have any of the extra bits that are tripping hazards. So for Cormac, mm -hmm. that piece was already done. The house was mm -hmm. already, I practically could get around it, which meant it was ready for him to be able to get around it. Mm -hmm. um, we did do some work in our backyard because that was a space I tended just not to use. It wasn't yes. accessible. Mm -hmm. And before he came along, it was just a space that I tended really not to ever really much be in. Mm -hmm. um, I really wanted him to have an outdoor space. Um, mm -hmm. I felt getting practice in moving in an outside environment would be very helpful to him before he moves on to things like play school and school and having his own independent orientation and mobility. So mm -hmm. uh, we did get we did get the backyard. We did get ramps and we did um, we did get it fully concreted to make it mm -hmm. uh, tidier and cleaner and, and easier to move around I did mm -hmm. practical things like removing uh, the rotary clothesline because it was a constant hazard for walking into mm -hmm. um, so now we have a really simple retractable real washing line which makes it there's no big metal pole to walk into which means there's not a, a constant collision hazard there okay. um, similarly the backyard is very empty in the sense that there aren't lots of equipment or mm. gadgets or things to walk into and um, probably for a sighted person one of the noticeable things about coming into my house would be that that it isn't very full of things um, I that works for me um, and would you be quite, quite organized in in how you'd have everything laid out and yeah have everything kept in the same place everything has a place mm. and Everything has to go back in that place. Um, that took a while for my husband to learn that system when he came. Yeah, okay. so, as you can imagine, it, it takes a, a two-year-old a while to learn that too. But mm -hmm. he, he learns it really innately. He's not conscious that he's learning it. I never told him directly to tuck in his chair when he gets up from his little toddler table. But he does it because he mm -hmm. observed me doing it at the kitchen table so he knows oh yeah when you stand up from the table we took in our chair mm. uh, he knows now why he does it uh, yeah. now he knows it's so that we don't trip over things but initially he just copied what I did and similarly mm. when it comes to his toys <laughs> which definitely was something to adapt to the amount mm -hmm. of toys a young child has um, <laughs> there's definitely more items in my household than there was previously <laughs> um, more I trip like yeah, I like that. I did find that that was an adjustment for me when he was small, even getting used to the idea that there was going to be a buggy somewhere in the house at all mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. There was going to be something like a high chair or 
a bouncer or as he's got bigger some of the big bigger equipment we have been able to rehome um mm-hmm. and each time we've been able to rehome something like that I've I've been relieved in the sense of going oh phew there's a and that's when I realized that it was something that I was always mentally having to mm-hmm. think about that it and register for my own mobility that when you get rid of something like the high chair you're thinking oh wow I'm not going to catch my foot in the corner of that leg and send it flying anymore mm-hmm. um, <laughs> uh, yeah as, as you move up those stages you're quite you're mm-hmm. quite glad that you're thinking yeah okay some of that big equipment is gone okay so and he's he's obviously absorbing those little tips um from you at, at such a young age um so he's obviously picking up quite a bit yeah uh, like he knows now already that toys go in certain boxes and he knows where they belong in his room when we're packing them up in the night in the evening time he he knows which box has which things when he's looking for things so he knows mm-hmm. where to look for if he wants a particular type of car or a particular animal or or lego or something he knows which box to go to and he's learning that instinctively now he's learning it mm-hmm. at an age where he doesn't realize he's learning it mm-hmm. so he's starting to develop those organizational skills very young Mm-hmm. And to be honest, as a blind person, they've probably been the thing that stands to me the mm-hmm. most in my daily life in terms of mm-hmm. getting out the door in the mornings mm-hmm. when your household is organized and you know where to find the milk and the cereal and your shoes. Mm-hmm. It makes practically mm-hmm. getting the day to day tasks of life done a lot easier. So having that kind of strict organization around you is, is allowing you to navigate the day a, a little bit easier and yeah much more efficient mm. you could mm. still do it but it would take a lot longer and I think it would have a lot more frustration and um, mm. if you don't know where your shoes are and you're in a hurry and you're trying to get out the door and you're, you're thinking I'm going to be late for work or I'm going to be late for an appointment that adds a level of frustration and stress to your mm. day that you just don't need every day and it almost in a way adds a reminder first thing every morning you can't see you can't see where these things are you bypass that emotional piece and that frustration piece Mm -hmm. simply by putting your shoes in the one corner every night you know where they are in the morning you put them on you're out the door and you haven't started your day off with that negative piece of frustration and stress Mm -hmm. and for me that that makes a difference it makes a difference being able to to know where things are and it probably gives you more independence because you're not having to call on another person to go look I can't find such and such can you find Mm -hmm. it for me which if you're doing that 10 times a day is going to make you feel more de- more dependent and mm-hmm. less capable and less able. Whereas if you're able to to find the things you need for yourself, that mm-hmm. gives you a sense of empowerment and a, a sense mm-hmm. of independence. What what are your your thoughts for the future or do you have any concerns? Um, what, what are your thoughts, say, for, for Cormac for the future? Um... I suppose because I've been through the education system myself and because having worked in the youth work sector and having quite a lot of contact with the current education system, I maybe don't have as many concerns about his academic Mm -hmm. journey as a sighted parent might have. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm quite comfortable with the idea that he may need to use assistive technology. Mm -hmm. He may need to learn in a very alternative format. He He might need to to learn through listening and memory. Um, I'm totally fine with that too. I don't mind if he doesn't if he doesn't see the letters in the same way that an, a sighted child does or if he doesn't colour in the pictures the same way. Or um, mm-hmm. I suppose I have a confidence that comes through experience that in some ways is a gift that another parent may not have that I know at the end of the day he'll get through the education system. And mm-hmm. with some supports, he'll do he can do that very well. Um, mm-hmm. I suppose my concerns more are around his mobility and his safety. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, like academically and long term in terms of employment. I think he will find his own level in that and, and he will find his own way with mm-hmm. that. But with his mobility and his safety, um, those mm-hmm. things kind of, especially when he's young, they concern me because as a parent you have to let him go you have to let him be in an environment that you can't control um Mm -hmm. and you have to hope that maybe the other adults there 
are going to remember that he might need some extra assistance or you're going to have mm-hmm. to hope that the other children will extend him a little bit of understanding and kindness. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a concern. That's a fear of of uh, mm-hmm. having having been his primary care for two and a half years mm-hmm. and having been able to minimise some of those difficulties for him. Now mm-hmm. my job as a parent is actually to start letting him go a bit and letting him uh, take those steps forward into a more independent world. Mm-hmm. And that in and of itself will involve things like maybe other children hurting his feelings. Mm-hmm. It will ha- involve things like maybe him having to be able to answer other children as to why he wears a patch and why he wears his glasses. Mm-hmm. A time will come when he will probably have to tell his peers why his mommy has a guide dog and uh, there may be a time where where that that could be a source of of teasing or bullying for him. Those kind of elements I worry about. Um, mm-hmm. That kind of social and emotional piece. Um, mm-hmm. And I suppose in the long run, that's the kind of thing that the the work you put in every day with your child that that mm-hmm. keeping in the, keeping the conversation going, keeping the communication open. Uh, that slow, lifelong confidence building that you do with a child and resilience building. I suppose I hope those will be the kind of ways that I will give him the tools to negotiate that part of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I suppose, you know, y- y- I suppose your own experience um, and and I suppose your own uh, opinion and um, attitude to to um, experience and vision loss yourself, but I suppose you're able to um, to have that personal um, you have that personal insight, um, and you can you can I suppose you can go back to what you've done yourself, and um, you you did move to to university, moved away from home, um, and you did that all yourself as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I believe you didn't have support or you didn't have a PA. No, 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 I didn't. No, <laughs> no. Um, and I suppose, you know, I, I think uh, I suppose having having that journey um, um, stands to you, but it also kind of gives you um, an idea of what can be done as well. And yeah, and, and in some ways, I think Cormac probably has an advantage over some other vision pair children in the sense that he will know it was one of the reasons why even when he was very little I was always determined that I would take him out like I will put him in the pouch and and bring him places pushing the buggy with a guide dog or a cane is not a not a runner for for any person mm-hmm. out there who's who's blind or visually impaired and is considering parenting um <laughs> it's not practical mm-hmm. it doesn't work with a guide dog and it doesn't work with a cane so um mm-hmm get a good pouch a really good carry pouch and uh, yeah. we have one which is called a boba and they can fit in it up until they're four and um, okay. I will say it's it's a it's a heavy task at this stage at two and a half to carry him in it Um, now he goes up on my back in it so it, it, when they're very tiny they go in, in your front and, and then as they get bigger okay. you can put them up on your back Um, yes. but I will say it's it was something for me I've always been determined that I want him right from the start to know that mommy doesn't just stay at home because she can't mm-hmm. see. She goes out in the world. She takes chances. She might be absolutely terrified sometimes. Mm-hmm. I can still remember the first morning I took him by myself to Crumlin, which mm-hmm. involved a almost three hour train journey and then getting a Dublin city bus out to Crumlin. And it was just me and him and the guide dog in the pouch and mm-hmm. um, a very early start. And I, I remember I remember being absolutely terrified. And it was something, until I'd had him, I'd been quite willing with my guide dog to take a chance and go somewhere new and different and go, ah, sure, if I get a bit lost, I, I'll ask somebody the way or I'll eventually find my way home. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. As a parent... That was a lot more scary as a prospect because it wasn't just you that could get lost. It was the potential that you could get yourself and your baby lost. Um, and it was just that that extra piece of physically trying to coordinate a backpack for his change stuff, a front pouch for him to be on your front and 
the dog and the harness and the, um but it was something that I'm glad I did because having to do it for the hospital mm-hmm. meant that the next a few days later when I just fancied a walk at home in my own locality it didn't seem daunting at all I was thinking oh I made it all the way to Dublin on Monday I can definitely make it to the local shop today mm-hmm. and it meant I had the confidence to go to go out more with him and to start taking him to like um baby group or mm-hmm. a little like a rhyme time thing in, in the library and, mm-hmm. and I, I think for him yeah okay he's still very little but as he grows if he realizes mommy is just as able to walk to play school and collect me as daddy is or mm-hmm. mommy is willing to walk me to to school or to scouts or whatever the activity he decides to to like um that's a message that he w- it won't just be something I'm telling him it'll be something I'm doing and showing him that he can see mm-hmm. that being blind isn't going to prevent him from going places and, and participating in the world mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. absolutely I think that that's incredible uh, advice um, and experience to share and I think just finally we'll, we'll, we'll probably wrap it up but but finally do you have any any last kind of pieces of practical advice that you'd like to share with with parents um you know who are supporting say their own children or you know even you know parents who have a vision impairment themselves is there anything that you would you'd like to share with with them um i suppose what's worked really well for us is talking talking all of the time i think it's played a role in Cormac's language being as good as it is. I think it uh, it means he's starting to get a better understanding of what I need and what he needs. Um, I think on a really practical level, it means I know where he is, <laughs> so I don't crash into mm-hmm. him. I think talking has made the biggest difference. Like I literally, Cormac and I talk from six a.m. till till bedtime. We we mm-hmm. chat all day long. We mm-hmm. if I'm if I'm doing something in the kitchen, I'm telling him. So he might be in the next room, but he will often call into me and say, can you hear me? And once he knows he, that I can hear him, he's happy to play alone for a while because he's he's got that contact. As a tiny baby, that contact needs to be very physical and he, he had to be in my arms or, or touching me. Whereas now he's now settling for that auditory contact of yeah she can hear me and I can hear her and often I'll be out in the kitchen and I'll be giving him a running commentary on what I'm doing and how I'm doing it so that he's picking up some of that learning if it's just something like I'm draining the past and I'm telling him Cormac I'm using this colander and I've maybe taken a few moments to go out to the sitting room and show put it in his hand show it to him show Mm -hmm. him how it works so that he knows, okay, mommy's draining the pasta and she's doing it with the colander because it's safer and it means she's not going to burn her hands. Mm-hmm. He now knows, oh, that's the way I could do pasta when I'm bigger. You know, he, he's yeah. that constant conversation or when we're going somewhere and I'm giving instructions to the guide dog, I'm also telling Cormac before we do his so that he's on me, he's in the pouch <clears throat> and I'm saying to him, Cormac, in a, few, in a few minutes we're going to turn left or we're going to turn right or or we're going to go around a roundabout or we're, you know, I'm, I'm cueing him for little cues that mm-hmm. would help him in his environment. Something like now we're listening for the road that sounds busy. Now we're listening for the road that sounds really quiet or the road that we can hear the trees moving on that he's I'm building up that sense of being able to move in the world in a non-visual way so that he has, there's a possibility that he may, not always have the vision that he has today mm-hmm. the vision he has today yes is visually impaired but it's vision but there mm-hmm. may come a day when he may have no vision mm-hmm. and so sometimes I'm also conscious of remembering to do some of the that prep work so that he has a backup he has an al- alternative mm-hmm. if the sight does go on and particularly if it goes on him suddenly that he will have some kind of reassurance to know that he still has skills to manage in the world and he's tapped into all of those other senses to to work on those to to use those as 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 well as he can yeah brilliant avril thank you so much for for joining us today and and sharing your experience and all your tips your parenting tips um it's greatly appreciated so thank you so much for your time no problem
and um and i'll be speaking to you soon thanks a million thank you thanks avril bye 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 Leanne. thanks